sinusitis through the thermal gelation of curdling. So a little background information just so everybody knows what we're going to be talking about. Blackberries are a couple different species of plants that belong to the Rubus genus. The color that's responsible for this in here is from anthocyanin, water soluble pigments. The levels of which can vary greatly in a blackberry, anywhere from as low as about 67 milligrams per 100 gram, all the way up to 250. Uh, Amphocyanin is going to be very important, so I want everybody to kind of be on the same page here. This is a, one of the basic structures of an anthocyanin. You get it's a couple of different rings put together. The naming, as far as whether it's a cyanidin, pelagiridin, pionidin, is dependent upon any sort of functional group in that R1 position. So if it's a hydroxyl, we're going to call it cyanidin. If it's just a hydrogen, pelagonidin. That way, you guys know what I'm talking about in a bit. The other naming, so after you have your cyanidin, depending on any sort of sugar moiety that you have in the other R position, if you have a glucose, rhythmose, whatever, makes it you know, a cyanidin-3 glucoside or a cyanidin-3 retinoside. So just so you guys know what we're going to talk about here. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody is aware, though, that pH is very, very important for the color of the sinus. If you're at a neutral or a more basic pH, they're going to appear blue. If you shift maybe to a 4 to 5 pH, they're going to be colorless. And if you start getting below 4, 3, 2 in that area, they're going to be a very red color. The reason for this is right here. This structure of an anthocyanin is called a flavillium cation. The reason it's called that is on that O, there's a plus charge on it. When it is in this form, it's going to be a red color. It's predominant in this form when you're below pH 3. So if you're at a pH 2, anything like that, you're going to have a red color because of this one. The pH is going to be very important, and I'll come back to that in a bit for you guys. So I'm pretty sure most people have heard of encapsulation, microencapsulation, but maybe isn't really sure what it is. It was initially started by the pharmaceutical industry. They have a little bit more money to do research, so they kind of founded it. The things that they were looking at is they'd have these drugs, bioactive compounds, whatever. But the problem with them is maybe they're not very stable. So encapsulation is a way that you can increase the stability. Maybe you want to control the release so it doesn't immediately break down in your product. Or sometimes maybe you have a lipophilic substance that you want to put in something that's water. So you might have to encapsulate it just to change the solubility. And the, I guess at the very basis of it, you take some sort of active compound, a drug, flavor, color, whatever, mix it with some sort of other compound, maybe a polysaccharide, protein, just kind of depending on your exact application. You mix it and then you'll get some sort of capsule. So a basic representation is something like this, where you've got your active compound. A lot of times you're gonna have a homogeneous mixture of both your active compound and your encapsulating material. Um, depending on the exact way that you make it, you may or may not have a specific layer on the outside. Some do, some don't. It just kind of depends on the specifics of it. Um, the materials that were looked at in this study, the first one was curdlin. It is a polysaccharide that's produced by bacteria. It's got a basic structure like this where, I think most people are familiar with cellulose being glucose, but as a beta 1,4. This is similar, but instead of being a 1,4 leakage, it's a 1,3. It causes it to have different properties than you would with cellulose. And when you heat it, you will get a thermally induced gel. Another thing that was looked at was alginate or arginic acid, depending on what you want to call it. It is uh, created from algae. It's another polysaccharide. It's a little bit different than most polysaccharides because instead of just having uh, one sugar moiety, it's actually got two that occur in blocks. So this is a mineric acid, and the other one is a galeronic acid. Then instead of maybe just alternating one or the other, they're occurring in blocks. So you might have 10 or 20 of the of the mineric acids in a row, and then you'll have 10 or 20 of the glyronics, and this varies on you know, lots of different factors, but it's, it's important to how they gel, and the size can vary greatly, anywhere from a small, anywhere to a really, really large polysaccharide. And then the third polysaccharide which was investigated was pectin, which I think everybody's pretty much familiar with. It's a plant polysaccharide. It's made up of galactronic acids. The important aspect of this is the degree of methylation that you have occurring. In this one, I showed what would be considered a low methoxy pectin. So less than 50% of these esters are esterified in this case. If it's more than 50, it's considered high methoxy. And the gelling properties are totally different for a high versus a low methoxy. So what we needed to do was identify the gelling ability of our three polysaccharides. So we did a 2, a 5, and a 6% solution. In this case, pH was very important because, as I said earlier, if you want a vibrant red color out of your anthocyanin, you need to stay below pH 3. So we looked at 1.52 and 2.5. 4% of 
For the alginate and the pectin, in order for them to form a gel in our setup, you have to add calcium chloride. It helps link neighboring polymers together. And we increased, we heated a little bit to increase the solubility, but you've got to be careful with the anthocyanins. If you heat them too much, it'll actually degrade your compounds too much. What we discovered is that no matter what the concentration, at a pH 1.5 and pH 2, both pectin and alginate were insoluble. So immediately we're, we're having problems that are just not working very well. At pH 2.5 it was soluble, but the gel form was very weak. So pectin and alginate are not a good polysaccharide to use in this specific setup. The Kirkland, however, did form a gel for all the concentrations and all the pHs with the pH or sorry, with the 2% concentration being a weak gel, so we want to go with something higher, more in the maybe a 4 to 6 range. So, how we make our capsules? We made 30 milliliters uh, solutions of Kirkland at varying amounts at a pH 1.5. We want this pH, that way the color would be the strongest and most prominent we could. We added 5 mils of our blackberry extract. We heated this homogeneous mixture at 40 degrees Celsius. It was then spray atomized onto a soybean oil bath that was heated and stirred at 80 degrees Celsius. After we had enough of it collected in there, we washed away all the soybean oil and just had encapsulated anthocyanins in our curve. Um, over on the left side, the percentage there is the percentage of Kirkland in the finished capsule. So they, they vary a little bit. As you can see, the mean size of the capsules were a little bit different depending on the percent Kirkland, but not a huge difference. The percent moisture was a little bit of a larger difference between the percentages of Kirkland. And encapsulation efficiency was really determined by how much Kirkland you had. Uh, the equation how that was figured out is right here. For the surface anthocyanin content, the gels were quickly washed in a 1% methylonic HCL, and then pH differential anthocyanin determination was done. And that was compared to the total anthocyanin content of the gel, where the gels were actually physically macerated, broken up in that same 1% uh, HCl and methanol. So that kind of told us how much it could hold in the gel versus how much would easily be washed off on the outside. We wanted to look at if the process itself modify the anthocyanins in any way. So you had original blackberry anthocyanins, you encapsulated them. Did anything happen to that specific profile? So we did a you know, HPLC chromatographic analysis. As you can see right here in our before and after percentages, that they differ slightly. As you can see afterwards, the cyanidin-3 glucoside amount went up a little bit, while the cyanidin glucosides that had organic acid attached to them decreased. So you could easily surmise that some of those organic acids were lost and so they kind of transferred from this into just your normal cyanidin 3 glucoside. But overall, not a big difference in the profile. The next thing we looked at is how stable are these gels in, a, in just a model buffer system. So we took one gram, put it into 10 mils of a buffered pH 1 solution. We monitored at 510 nanometers every 10 minutes. 510 to 520 is what anthocyanins absorb at maximally. So it was a good one. And then we kind of looked at the release kinetics that we found. So what you have right here on the major graph is the percent release over time. As you can see, we did points every 10 minutes. And then you also have where we try to figure out if it was zero first, second order kinetics by plotting the natural log over time. I'll discuss that a little more here. So all three of the gels lost anthocyanins, and all three lost them pretty quickly. For the 5.1 and 5.6% Kirkland gels, Almost 100% of the anthocyanin was lost out of the gel within 10 minutes. This, uh, in encapsulation terms, is referred to as a bursting as it goes into solutions. And this is typically a very undesirable property. You don't want to encapsulate something and then have it immediately get lost when you put it in the solution. Uh, we did find, though, that for all three of our gels that it followed a first order kinetic. So we were able to look at some rate constants and how quickly it did lose out of it. And that the 4.3% had the lowest rate of loss at this point is 0 0.09 uh, anthocyanin per minute. The theory with this is that it's somehow related to the moisture content of those gels. So if you remember how the moisture content compares to the release rates, you'll see that although it's not a complete linear relationship between moisture and the release constant, there is some similarities going on where at a lower moisture, the release rate is a little bit lower. So this could be something for further investigation to look at. So conclusions from this study was that capsulation wasn't cheap. It was possible to take anthocyanins, 
mix them together with the curdlet and form some sort of microgels. However, the initial burst upon putting it into a buffer solution is very undesirable. The exact reason isn't fully understood yet. With gels, there's still a lot that has to be investigated. One of the possible theories is that there is a, a general lack of interaction between the polymer, polysaccharide in this case, and our pigment. So although that they're in a matrix together, they're not really interacting with each other. The other thing is that the curdlin gel is kind of porous. It forms kind of a triple helix shape, which it's not very of a not a very tight gel, so it's possible that the anthocyanins can simply diffuse out of this gel. So going forth from here, uh, further studies are definitely necessary to figure out if curdlin could still be used or if it's just not a preferred polysaccharide to do microencapsulation work. Uh, thank you guys very much. <laughs>